Hello and welcome back to The Hatch. I'm Rosie Murphy. And I'm Sammy Roth, and this is the podcast where we talk about Lost. We are back for another season, season three, which means we're starting off with A Tale of Two Cities. We are going to have uh, the first part of a conversation this week with Jean Higgins. If you don't uh, know about Jean Higgins, you really should. She was one of the people on the ground in Hawaii who was really running the show and, and making it happen alongside Jack Bender, and she's got some wonderful stories to share. Let's get to it. So thank you to those uh, those listeners who have been with us the first two seasons, and welcome to, to everyone who's new to season three of The Hatch. Uh, if you're with us for the first time, we always start our episodes with hot takes, where Rosie and I each share a you know, hopefully flaming, sometimes mildly flaming take about that week's episode. And uh, so Rosie, what's your hot take? Yeah, so the degree of spiciness varies with the week. Um, That's mine a good way to put is it. about earthquake safety. Um, okay. So in the opening scene of A Tale of Two Cities, we see, of course, the plane crash from the perspective of the others who are meeting in a book club in Juliet's living room, and the ground just begins to shake. They seem to think it's an earthquake, and Juliet... Um, I think it's Juliet, actually, I'm not certain, shouts, get under a doorway. That is actually no longer good earthquake safety advice. Ooh, good point. Um, I missed that. That's actually not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to get under a table or a sturdy desk or something, the idea being to cover yourself in case something falls off the wall or, heaven forbid, the building collapses or something. Um, But don't really get under a doorway. There's not really a purpose to that. Yeah, and you know, I just checked the transcript here, and you're right, Juliet did say that, and I, I totally missed it when watching the episode. I, I guess I was distracted by, like, the plane crash or something, and I, I missed her. <laughs> In m- defense of the writers, I think that was common advice at one yeah. time. I yeah. remember hearing that when I first moved to California, um, but it's no longer in, in vogue as earthquake yes. safety tips. And I guess also in defense of the writers, maybe Juliet just doesn't know it's bad advice. Oh, boy. Okay, Sammy, what's your hot take? Oh, gosh, um... My hot take, I, I just want to basically, you know, sing the praises here as best I can of this opening scene, which besides the doorway thing is totally magnificent. Um, and mm-hmm. what I really love about it is I I feel like this is a scene where the concept is just so good. Like, hey, we're going to learn that the others have this, you know, modern society type mm-hmm. village on the island and we're going to see the plane crash from their perspective. Like, that's a scene that you could do a sucky job with, and it would still probably yeah. be pretty great. Like you, just because just, the twist is so good. It's such a good twist, and yet that, but it's just like the execution of how they pull this off. I just, the writing is brilliant. Like the mm-hmm. the amazing, you know, one liners. You know, so I guess I'm out of the book club. Yeah. You know, and and Juliet talking about free will right before the the house starts to shake. Yeah. Yeah, and well, and yeah, because it also reveals so much about the characters in such like a sparse way. It really does. Particularly Juliet and Ben, but also Goodwin a bit and some of the, the others. No, you're, you're totally right. It does so much in such a tight package. And the filming of it and the acting and like the thing where you don't see that it's Ethan under the house and actually mm-hmm. your first clue that this is the other's village is after Juliet rushes out, you see Ethan coming yeah. out from that shed. And it's like, Wait, what the fuck? Is that Ethan? <laughs> Like, it's just, it's it's brilliant. It's totally brilliant. And, you know, for whatever flaws the first half of season three might have, which I'm sure we'll discuss, like, this is a this is an all-time great scene on the show. Agreed. So should we talk about Jack now? <laughs> I, I suppose that is the meat of this episode. Um, as, you know, long-time listeners to the podcast will know, neither Sammy or I are huge Jack fans. Uh, but we're enjoying watching the evolution of his character, which is kind of on full view in this episode. What do, um, what do you mean, the evolution on full view? What are you seeing? Just terms of how like deeply shitty he was during his divorce. Eh. And, you know, there is a, a redemptive moment at the end where Juliet asks, What would you like to find out? Is she happy? Yes. Hmm. which I think is a very important kind of redemptive moment for Jack because he's finally realizing what's important here. You know, it's not his sort of selfishness and jealousy and his own emotions and satisfying those that's coming first. It's genuinely, is she happy? But it's a small redemption compared to just like how deeply bad an ex he is. 
basically every scene in this flashback as I was taking notes during the episode, my notes were just getting more and more like frantic and all capitalized and, you know, full of F-bombs. Mm-hmm. Like, Jack did this, Jack did that. It's like, excruciating to watch. Oh, my, first, you know, starting with, starting with asking her when she doesn't want to be asked and then getting into stalking and then, like, the crazy thing where he, like, thinks his dad is with Sarah and he gets into a fight with his dad. Oh, he dad. creates this absolute, like, batshit scenario out of one tiny scrap of evidence. It's... Uh, it's it's disturbing. It's and really, he, yeah, really he disturbing. Yeah, he tries to figure out who this guy is by going, I think, going through her phone. It's unclear how she how he has that list of numbers, but he's, like, calling random numbers from her contact list. And, yeah, I was thinking through this, like, this is genuinely scary behavior, and, like, Sarah mm-hmm. should file a restraining order. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Do, at, do not do this. At one point, I almost wrote down a note to myself about, you know, like, the thin line between being stubborn, which is a theme of this episode, and being yeah. obsessive. And then I thought, no, it's, like, it's not a thin line. Like, there's a very clear line that he crossed, like, basically right at the beginning of the flashback, moving in from stubbornness and obsession into, like, when stalking territory. When he's watching territory. her at work. Yeah, when he's watching her at yeah. work and going through the cell phone. And, you know, when he runs out of the police station after she's bailed him out of jail. Is that him? What difference does it make? It just does. It's not going to change Look, I want to know. I need to know who he is. It doesn't matter who he is. It just matters who you're not. Yeah, and she implies that, you know, his, there. it's implied that Christian has been sober for a few months, and the night Jack beats oh, him up, God. he goes back to drinking, and just a lot jack wreaks a lot of havoc i gotta tell you i'd I'd forgotten about the thing where jack drives his dad back to drinking me too that's so and then you know he's an alcoholic so who's to say that if this doesn't happen that something else doesn't happen he's been sober for 50 days but Mm -hmm. you know that's not a sure thing but it's like just to think that maybe this is the moment that leads to christian's death potentially it's so dark yeah Anyway, I um I did appreciate very much when Christian tells Jack to let it go, which is the exact line, of course, that we hear from Christian in the finale, <laughs> a place where you can, you know, learn to let it go, to let go. Yes. Yep. Anyway. I uh, now that we've... But, but yes, we are given some evidence at the end of this episode that Jack is growing here on the island. I, I was going to say, now that we've, you know, done our sort of normal bit of shitting <laughs> on Jack for a while, um, I should say that I, I really, surprisingly, actually respected seeing his stubbornness come through in the hydra station with juliet and his refusal to take the food his refusal to talk to her his you know i didn't really understand why he was yanking that chain at the top from the ceiling like i think he was just kind of playing around to see what escape routes existed i guess so i don't understand why he chose to open the door and let all the water out well he didn't know the water was going to come out that's true i guess he thought it might have been an empty threat and he was yeah. Well within his right, too. But my, I guess my, my point that I've dis- distracted myself from is that I, I just, you know, I, I, I think that even though arguably it was stupid and, like, he should have just accepted the food, like, the fact that he didn't want to give them the satisfaction, mm-hmm. didn't want to, you know, let his captors ingratiate themselves right. with him and just, you know, hold out as long as he could, like, yeah, good for Jack, actually. Like, that's, it doesn't, you know, counterbalance the stuff we see in the flashback, but it's, I, I feel like, a more positive side to his stubbornness that we see yeah and i feel like it comes from like an ethical place in hmm. terms of i know that these people have captured myself and kate and sawyer and i'm not going to like you said give them the satisfaction even of eating um until they give me some proof because what he keeps asking is i want to know that my friends are okay yeah absolutely. i want to see them and he is doing that in, to, hmm. to make sure that they're alive and that they're in theory being treated humanely I, I even um, thought when he went and attacked Juliet to try to get out, I thought that was totally justified. Yeah. I mean, I know she's Juliet, and we love her now, and she's, you know, trying to feed him, but, like, we from did Jack's perspective... Right. No, at, at this yeah. point, he's, you know, she's the woman that's keeping him captive in a cage. Right. 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 So, well, speaking of cages... Speaking of cages? Also have, the cages do pop pop in for the first time in this oh, episode. Oh, yes, they do. Um, we get that wonderful maybe the only bit of comedy in this episode where sawyer discovers the um systems that give him the (laughs) treats um which is like one of my favorite like 30 second arcs and i really enjoy um we meet carl for the first time it it only took the bears two hours is pretty fucking hilarious (laughs) tom Tom is the funniest other and i guess unless you want to argue that ben is funny but ben doesn't try to be funny right 
Yeah, the the cages, I mean, I, I do think you see in this episode, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, but like sort of some of the creative doldrums that, that Damon and Carlton like to talk about that they felt like they were in at yeah. the beginning of season three, like... You know, we know that the whole thing in the cage is going to get a, the cage is going to get a little annoying. I, I mm-hmm. thought the scene. I mean, I've I've never understood the scene where Ben makes Kate put on the dress and go to have breakfast with him. Like, it feels weirdly out of character for Ben. I don't yeah. know what he's trying to accomplish. Like, I, I I don't know that I just don't really know what's going on there. I agree. This is pretty random, but one thing that Ben says to Kate when they're sitting in the weird little like beachfront breakfast bar <laughs> is um, the next two weeks are going to be very unpleasant. Why two weeks? Uh, Cause that's how long Ben thinks it will take to convince Jack to do surgery on him. I don't know. I guess it just seemed like such an arbitrary thing to say for Ben who chooses his words so carefully. Yeah. I mean, this is what I was saying. That whole scene felt like it was kind of out of character for Ben. Yeah. Yeah. When when is Ben going to do something nice for someone to give them a good memory of something? Like, what's in it for him? Right. After this, he locks Kate in a cage and, like, and, and I think ultimately forces Kate and Sawyer to, like, work on the landing strip that they're building. Yeah. Like, to just do, like, you know, hard kind of gravel shoveling work. Yep. I don't know. Kate's I don't... still wearing the dress. Oh, God. <laughs> anyway, there's a lot of good stuff happening here as well. Yes. I, I, I think that the other thing about the first scene that I, I should have mentioned, Elizabeth Mitchell just makes such a wonderful impression yeah, right she away. Does. Like watching that first sequence, the moment, like right at the beginning where she's looking in the mirror and you can kind of see her starting to break up, mm-hmm. you know, to break down, I guess I should say. And she's holding back tears, it looks like. And she's, but she, she banishes them. She smiles. She goes back to her cookies. I, what was so impressive to me is like, that scene feels so much like Juliet. You know, we know what's happening in her head. We understand the turmoil that's ro- roiling her. She wants to leave the island. She knows she has to go through with this, you know, to mm-hmm. help Ben or he won't let her go. And I don't know if the actor, Elizabeth Mitchell, knows any of that. But, like, that, that from those first moments, it's a, it's a retrospect where it's like, yeah, this, this totally feels, like, consistent with who Juliet is and how she's handling things right now. It's really cool. Yeah, up to and including being kind of defiant in the book club scenario. Yeah. And like defending her position in this island society, even though she doesn't want to be there, but still fighting for kind of the respect of her other mates or her island mates. Um, You know, and, and kind of being like feisty and defensive of herself, even though, again, she has no real attachment to this place and indeed is trying to get out of here sooner rather than later yeah no it makes me really excited to like watch her character arc unfold this year me too and her relationship with ben as well which is all sorts of creepy yeah many many layers do you um do you have any hindsights oh yeah so for for new listeners we should explain we always end our episodes with a hindsight something that was different for us in retrospect yeah um something that really stuck with me is when Juliet tells jack that they have a, f- a copy of Christian's autopsy. That would have meant in island time that they had received a shipment of information from the real, the quote unquote real world mm-hmm. six ish weeks ago. Ooh. Um, Two ish months ago. Yeah. Let me, I'm going to look up the timeline here. I, th- yeah, I do think you're right. This is our first glimpse, glimpse of just how much, you know, contact Off they island have. Contact they have. Um, by the way, A Tale of Two Cities takes place on day 68, so a little over two months okay. since, since the crash. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, it's it feels in the moment really sinister because you're like, holy shit, how much, how are these people getting information? Like, yeah. we were told no one could find this island and like, or we, it's, you know, it's implied at this point that no one can find this island. Um, this French woman's been trapped here for 16 years and yet... Yeah. You got this report like two months ago, um, so super makes the others seem super powerful right away. And and you know what else? The when Jack lies about you know his background, oh I'm a repo man and this and that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like I forget if I I imagine that watching that for the first time, you might think that really truly Juliet doesn't know who he is and is asking because they don't have information. Right. Like I, 
but I, I, I mean, so just the moment when she comes at the end and just says like, you know, when she jokes, I'm a repo woman, ha ha right. ha, and, and Jack kind of realizes the joke's on him, like, that's kind of mind-blowing in itself that they have any of that. Oh, man. Yeah, despite all of the annoying stuff, like, this is this is a fabulous premiere, I think. It's not quite, you know, man of science, man of faith, but it's got a lot going for it. Yes, and I think, uh, <laughs> I think so much of our discontent with it is just that we know from so many of the cast and crew that we've talked to that there are a lot of people who are kind of dissatisfied with this chapter in lost history. Mm -hmm. And I think we've absorbed a little bit of that. Yeah. So I'm going to try and, to shed some of that. <laughs> I mean, and it makes sense. It's the chapter in lost history where as, as Damon and Carlton have said, they, they didn't have an end date. They didn't know mm -hmm. how long they were going to get this, you know, have to keep this going. And I think that by the time we get to like the middle of this season, things really pick up creatively and, and then pretty much from there till the end of the show, you don't have another stretch of episodes that anyone would consider, you know, weak on the whole. No. Yeah. Do you have a hindsight? Yeah, I was just going to um, point out how quickly and, like, elegantly they answered the questions of, like, why are there polar bears on the island and also why was there a shark with a Dharma logo on it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I just, you know, those were, honestly, those were two really big mysteries. I mean, the polar bears especially, because the Dharma logo on the shark was one of those things that fans, you know, caught on a screenshot and that maybe the wider public didn't know. But, like, mm -hmm. hey, credit to Lost Words do, like, they, they created mysteries, and then, in many cases, like this, very, you know, satisfactorily, they just, they answered them. Yeah. There you go. Dharma had a marine and bear research, research station. Program. Yeah. That's it. Why? Unclear doesn't really matter but they did <laughs> you know you could ask why 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 beneath every answer and ultimately find yourself asking what is the meaning of life and the show was not going to answer that well a question it asks though i just want to point out one other very small detail yeah. that i will bring up in a few weeks um so one of the interviews we have coming up is with dr Derek johnson um who is a professor of media studies and one of the scholars who wrote about Lost back in his heyday. And one of the things that he and I are going to talk about is all of the measures Lost takes to create a world that is separate from the real world. And one of those is by like consciously removing anything that could be construed as product placement. Um, like all the brands are fictional and like nothing has brands mm. on it. And instead of finding Bud Light, they find Dharma beer and so on. Um, but when Juliet puts her CD in the CD player at the very beginning, it doesn't have a label on it. It's just wow. like purely blank. You know, she didn't bring it from the mainland. Or it was just like a mix she made for her car. But, <laughs> or it was created here in this world without brands. That's blowing my mind a little bit. We will discuss further in a few weeks. Looking forward to that. Should we play the interview? Yes, on that note, we should. Sammy, why don't you set this up for us? Yeah, so we, um, as, as previewed at the beginning of this discussion, we have the first part here of a multi-part conversation with Jean Higgins. Uh, she was a co-executive producer on Lost. Um, basically, you had Damon and Carlton running the show from, you know, Los Angeles or Burbank or wherever the office was. And then in Hawaii on the ground, you had Jack Bender, who we talked to in our first season. Um, you should go back and listen to that conversation, by the way, if you hadn't. He's awesome. Uh, you had Jack Bender, who was sort of like the lead director and showrunner in Hawaii, and then working right alongside him, you had Jean Higgins, who um, she'll she'll describe her job in this episode, but but she was basically, uh, basically running the actual production of the show. And you met her at her home in Los Angeles. That's right. Uh, she's she's in the Valley. I went. We sat down. She actually gave me a gift, uh, which was really lovely. Um, she gave me the slate that Jack Bender used to direct the season two finale, Live Together, Die Alone. That's the thing that you see, you know, someone holds up before they start to do the shot and they sort of clap that thing down on top and say action. You know, and it's got like the scene number on it and the episode number. Anyway, I, I now physically have the slate from Live Together, Die Alone, which, which thank unreal. you, Jane. It's pretty cool. Oh, oh, with that in mind, let's play the interview. I'm here with Jean Higgins. She was a co-executive producer on Lost. Jean, thanks very much for being with us on The Hatch. Nice to be here. So you were involved with the show from the very beginning, right? The very beginning. From the pilot. First in, last out. How did that happen? Um, I had finished a show right before Christmas and heard a rumor about a show going to Hawaii. Being a good Southern California girl, I grew up surfing. I surfed in Hawaii in my teenage years. I have always loved Hawaii. I went, that's the show for me, tracked it down. 
Um, I knew the production exec at Disney, which is where I had just finished the show that I was doing at ABC. She said, do you know J.J. Abrams? I went, no. Do you know Sarah, his producer? No. <laughs> said, get me a meeting. So I had a meeting with Sarah. Liked her. I think she liked me. It went well. The next thing, I had a meeting with J.J. I thought, well, I think that went well. So, and I knew it was a very short fuse. So I thought, I think it went so well, I'm gonna run by, load up on groceries, because I have a feeling I may be leaving town really quick. So I called my husband, said, I'm going to Costco, I'm gonna load you up with everything, I think I may be leaving town. As I finished loading the groceries, I got the phone call, driving home, can you be on a plane tomorrow, but come by the studio first thing in the morning. And there you go. You had a good instinct. I had a good instinct, but um, it was literally by, I was on the one o'clock plane to Hawaii the following day. It's so funny to me to think about a time in the entertainment industry when anyone would have not known who J.J. Abrams was. Oh, I knew who he was. Oh, you knew I who just, was. You just did didn't know him. Know him. Okay, I got, oh, right, because he yeah. had already done like Felicity and Alias yeah. at that point, hadn't he? Okay. Our paths just hadn't, hadn't crossed. Hadn't crossed. What, so what exactly were you hired to do originally? Uh, well, they had no script at the time. Oh. So JJ had sort of walked me through in the meeting what the show was about, uh, what we needed to do, and I thought, okay, I'll get to Hawaii. I know that there's military bases there. I can probably find a hulk of an airplane. Um, so I was busy scouring the island for an airplane, and JJ called up and said, Gene, it's got to be a wide body. I went, I am never going to find a wide body on the island of Oahu or anywhere in Hawaii. So I called Sarah and uh, said, we got to have a wide body. There's two plane graveyards. Let's check them out. So it turned out that the plane was a Lockheed L-1011 that lived in Mojave Desert. Sarah went up, took a look at it, <clears throat> and um, within two, de two days, we made a deal. We hired a crew and we started ripping it apart so we could put it in <laughs> containers and ship it over. In the meantime, I'm calling the studio and who had left me with two instructions. As I walked out the door, they said, Gene, there's two things. One, don't go over budget. And two, never tell JJ no. <laughs> those two things, I feel like, might come uh, into conflict with each other. Those two things are mutually <laughs> exclusive. So I turned around and I under said, you understand what that means? And they looked at me, and I made the, because we're doing tape here, I made the hand gesture for money. <laughs> and they said, yes. And out the door I went. So at the time, uh, we were the most expensive pilot ever made. Do you remember what, what you paid for that airplane? Yes, $35,000. Okay. But it cost me 450 to ship it to Hawaii. <laughs> Okay. So, so you were actually like, how would you describe what your job was on Lost over the years? Like you, I, I know you were a producer, but I think to a lot of TV viewers, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, I'm the one who had to figure out how to bring it to life. Okay. They would deliver me the most incredible scripts. I take the script, I break it down, I figure out what it costs, I figure out the schedule that we're going to shoot it, the order that we're going to shoot it in how to essentially gather all the people and the resources in order to create it and um, put it all together. Hmm. So you were, you were doing basically everything except writing the scripts and telling the actors how to read their lines, Yeah, it sounds like. Okay. Yeah. That's, an, that's an important job. <laughs> <laughs> what... Um... And by the way, I, I, I was looking up old interviews with you, and I saw somewhere you said that you moved your, your teenage son out with you to Hawaii at a certain point. Yes, he Is was right? 14. What he did... came for the summer after we did the pilot, and I realized that the show was a huge success. It hadn't aired yet, but I knew it was going to be. You did? Yeah. Okay. And I called my husband, who is my son's stepfather, and uh, I said, he's in high school. The show's going to go. I won't see him. He'll be off to college. I won't see him. He's coming to Hawaii. So, he well, he's staying. So he was already there. So I told my son, I said, um, 
you're staying. You're going to go to high school here. He hated me because, of course, he was 14 and sure. all his friends were here. And I thought, how can you hate me for bringing you to Hawaii? <laughs> Suffice it to say that I came home. He didn't. He still lives there. Wow. So, okay. Did he learn to surf? No, he was never interested. <laughs> never really interested. So, um, But he lives there. He's a teacher there. He's very happy. One of the things I found most interesting about talking to people who are involved with Lost is just how it how the act of doing the show literally changed their lives. I mean, we were, we were talking with Henry and Cusick last year, and he's still out there with his family. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, Ian's there. Uh, the first AD, Richard, st- uh, he went back. He retired there. Mm-hmm. Um, we we had not too many. By the end of the, the run of Lost, I would say that probably 90% of the crew is local. Okay. When you watch, I mean, I'm not saying, you don't watch Lost today, obviously. Or probably I haven't not. seen it for you a long time. When, when one is to watch Lost, you know, where where would you see, you know, your influence the strongest on the show? Like when, when you know, I'm watching Lost, you know, where can I go and say, oh, like, that was that was Jean Higgins. Like, that's, that's totally her right there. Oh, I'll give you a couple of funny ones. Yeah. Um, the end of season two. The one I just gave you the slate for. Yes, we have sitting okay, here on, on the, the table the uh, the slate for Jack Bender, his director slate for the Live Together Die Alone. But anyway, sorry, continue. Um, it was the scene where where Sawyer and Harold are blown up on the raft. Harold being a Harold Perrineau who played Harold Michael. Perrineau, yeah. yes, Michael. And, uh, and they've just stolen Walt, right? Right, season, uh, season one finale, I should say. Was it season one? Yeah, yeah, when... I know the show by heart. It's season one. But that's okay. Can, I, keep going okay. on the story. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll make a very brief. No, no, no. It's fine. We had shot the scene. It was the last night of shooting. Now, I used to do a lot of cleanup work. So if we had pickup shots or second unit shots, I did all the underwater. I did all the aerials. So I got a call from Damon. And said, Gene, we need, we need a better close-up of Walt, or excuse me, of Harold in the water. I'm thinking, oh my gosh. First of all, Harold Perrineau did not swim. (laughs) He would just believe us when we said, Harold, jump and we'll catch you. (laughs) I identify, I don't swim either. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, so Harold had already jumped in the water, absolutely terrified. And of course we would fish him out. Um, But on this particular night, it was done. Jack was an hour south in the jungle doing the major scenes. I was up at Police Beach doing pickup shots for various things. I did have Harold Perrineau with me on that unit, but I had no water unit. I had no boats. There was nothing. There was no way to light the water. I'm thinking, how do I get a shot of Harold in the water? So I remember many, many years prior, I had walked onto a set and saw the most bizarre thing of cellophane attached to uh, monofilaments. Well, Sven Nyquist was shooting Cannery Row. And if you walked around and looked out the dock on the set, mind you, this was on stage 30, it was the ocean. And I looked at John Bartley, the DP, and I said, don't laugh. I have this idea, and if Sven Nyquist can do it, we can do it. I literally had the PAs run, get me some cellophane, stretched it between two C-stands. We got a torch so we would have the burning raft in the background. We put the torch right at the edge of the cellophane so it looked like the raft was burning. I got a big bucket, put it on an apple box, filled it up with water, said, Harold, stick your head in the water and come up yelling, Walt, right? The DP looked at me like I was crazy. I'm looking at you like you're crazy right now. I said, just go with me. We're going to try this. (sighs) So we did it. It worked perfectly. I looked at John Bartley and I say, do we tell anybody what we did? What if it doesn't look as good on film as it did on the monitor? We better tell Jack. So when we finished shooting for the night, Jack had a later call than I did. So we went down to the jungle and I told Jack what I did. He looked at me like I was insane. We looked at the dailies the next day. It was perfect. Nobody has ever known. And that's the iconic shot of Michael yelling, Walt, when you cut to commercial there, right? Yes. 
Wow. So a couple of years later, we have all of our characters in the big life raft, right? Mm -hmm. They're about to get picked up on the searcher, which was by the name, uh, by the way, the real name of the boat. Okay. <clears throat> Jack looked at me and he goes, I don't want to spend all night on the ocean. Jack would get seasick. And I should, I should say, by the season four finale, I believe, there's right. no place like home. Yeah. So, um, so Jack says, let's do your cellophane gag. <laughs> I go, Jack, that was one close-up. I don't know about six actors, I think it was, in the life raft. I said, we better test this. So we took two 20 by frames that you normally use to stretch, you know, silks or blacks or something. We stretched them with cellophane. We tested it. Uh, the only way you know that we weren't actually on the water is if you go back and look really, really close. The grips who were moving the frames uh -huh. never quite got in sync with the movement of the boat. But if you're watching that, you're not paying attention to the right. story. I don't think that's even on Lostpedia, so probably no one in the universe has noticed. <laughs> no one knows about this story. So, wow. so there you go. Cellophane is ocean. One of my favorite things from this conversation and something I think is so telling is that when you ask Jean if she remembers how much the plane cost, she remembers exactly the price tag, $35,000, as well as the fact that it cost almost a half million dollars to ship it to Hawaii, which is A, wild to me, like totally inconceivable, and B, just really indicative that she has a great detail-oriented way of working <laughs> yeah she and i love that she like remembered that so many years later one of these people who just like has their shit together because you have mm -hmm. to for a job like that yeah i, I frankly was like surprised that the thirty-five thousand number was so low like but but you know wh Apparently, who am i to say i don't multiple have plane graveyards where you can go and purchase this thing and i've been yeah. up by that that plane graveyard in the mojave by the way really yeah it's right by um it's by like the old mojave airport um I went up there to do a story a couple months ago about wind energy because it's near all the Tehachapi windmills, and uh, you drive right by it. <laughs> Shout out to the Tehachapi uh, windmills. First indeed. mention on the podcast. <laughs> first and probably last. Let's yes. be real. Um, I, I, I got to say that, that the fact that that famous shot of Michael oh my God. close up yelling, Walt, Walt, Walt. The fact that that was not really filmed with him in the water through this like weird jury-rigged setup that she developed it's crazy Astounding. to me. Astounding. I want to go back and watch that scene as soon as we hang up. Yeah, I think we're going to have some listeners who are going to just pause at that moment and go check it out yeah. as well because it's like Please unbelievable. Please do. Anyway, yeah. we'll, um, we'll have more, uh, more from Jean next week when we, when we come back for episode two of The Glass Ballerina. Absolutely. Well, we are so excited to be back for season three. I hope you are also a little bit excited. Um, if so, you probably already know this, but you can talk to us on social media throughout the week. Uh, we are at on Twitter at The Hatch Podcast and at Facebook.com slash The Hatch Podcast. And please, 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 we always ask this, but it would be lovely if you could drop us a rating or review on your podcast app. It helps other people find the show and it makes us feel really good about doing this. We got to say thank you to Andy G. Cohen for our theme music and to Danny Roth for our cover art. And we will be back next week. Namaste. Thank you.